tonight. A former care aide accused of sexually assaulting and exploiting residents at a Saskatchewan group home has pleaded guilty. Also, an I-Team investigation. Five foreign workers hired by a Manitoba trucking company say they were taken advantage of and treated differently than Canadian employees. Incoming! Plus, a dad from Buffalo Pound Lake may deserve a trophy for the most elaborately designed backyard rink. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Wednesday, March 8th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Tonight is a special prairie-wide broadcast where we welcome viewers from across Manitoba and Saskatchewan. A man accused of sexually assaulting residents at a Saskatchewan care home has pleaded guilty. Kendall Latimer was at the hearing today and brings us the story. Rick Bogowski was at court this morning with his brother Daryl one of Brent Gabona's victims. The brothers traveled from Alberta to Rostern to witness Gabona's guilty plea, but Gabona appeared by phone. Brent Gabona raped my brother for up to 17 years. The fact that he can enter a guilty plea from the comfort of his home, well, my brother stands here today, I think speaks volumes about the justice system and this case in particular. Gabona pleaded guilty to hurting the very people he was supposed to be helping. Those charges include three counts of sexual assault and two counts of sexual exploitation of a person with a disability. I'm hoping that Brent Gabona will spend many years in prison, but I'm not counting on it. Gabona worked at a Hepburn care home that supported adults with physical and cognitive disabilities. They needed help with bathing, dressing and eating. Gabona abused residents over a span of 17 years, beginning in the early 90s. He was charged last May. It's been really hard because we talk about Gabona from time to time and I have to reassure Daryl that he is safe and nothing like that is going to happen again. Bogowski doesn't believe the criminal justice system will give them the accountability or answers that he and his brother need. So after Gabona entered his guilty pleas, the Bogowskis went to the Saskatoon courthouse to start a civil action against Gabona, the care home and the government. We are filing a lawsuit today and uh, we will seek the answers that the Crown and the police have not been able to, to gather. Gabona's sentencing hearing has been scheduled for October. He has been ordered to attend in person. Kendall Latimer, CBC News, Rostern. The former president of the University of Regina is publicly clarifying her ancestry amid a CBC investigation examining her indigenous heritage. Vianne Timmons served as U of R president from 2008 until 2019. She's now the head of Memorial University of Newfoundland. Timmons says claiming membership in an unrecognized First Nation band didn't open any doors for her. More than a decade ago, when Timmons was at the U of R, she began noting on her resume that she was a member of the Broadwar Mi'kmaq First Nation, a band unrecognized by both the Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq and the federal government. They sent me actually a membership card to the Bador Band and at that time I did um, acknowledge it. I think it was 2009 around there. And then I looked into it on my own and I didn't feel comfortable identifying as a member of a band that wasn't official or a member of a band anyway. But in your professional CVs and bios for years it was noted that you were a member of Bador. Well I removed it fairly quickly. Um, if, it, if it was stayed it would have been maybe on the internet or something where you put a CV and it stays forever. Timmons also says she's never claimed that she's Mi'kmaq, just that she has Mi'kmaq heritage. CBC research reviewed by a genealogical expert found her Mi'kmaq ancestry dates to the 1600s rather than the 1800s, as she has said. The Court of King's Bench in Saskatoon had to open a second courtroom today at a first-degree murder trial. Supporters of the victim, Ali Moosehead, filled the courthouse to make a powerful statement on International Women's Day. Dan Zakraski brings us the story. Drums, hey, 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 hey. tears, posters calling for justice. 
and dozens of family and friends. They're here on International Women's Day to reclaim Ellie Moose Hunter's story. Today it was so um, fitting to come and honour Allie and um, not the way she died, but the person whom she is, uh, the woman that she is, the hardworking lady, the kind, the compassionate, the family-oriented lady. 28-year-old Ellie Moose Hunter loved her family and worked hard at her job. She never missed a shift and always answered texts. So her brothers were concerned back in early March 2020 when they heard she hadn't shown up for work and they couldn't reach her. They went to the basement suite she shared with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Ivan Martel. They found their sister dead on the bathroom floor. She had been beaten, strangled by hand, and stabbed ten times. Police arrested Ivan Martel and charged him with first-degree murder. We're now in the second week of his murder trial. Each day, Ellie Moose Hunter's parents, brothers and sisters all file into the courtroom and listen to the testimony. But today, it was about more than their daughter and sister. This could have been anyone. This could have been myself. This could have been my daughters. It could have been anyone, our sisters, because no one asks for this and for this to, um, to happen is just so disgusting. And it offers to um, the terror and the fear that we live. Um, but coming here on International Women's Day uh, shows that we will be there for, each, for one another. The Crown is expected to wrap its case tomorrow. It's not known whether Martel will take the stand in his own defence. Dan Zakreski, CBC News, Saskatoon. The Saskatchewan government says it will provide operational funding for second stage shelters in the upcoming budget. Our province is one of only a few in the country that doesn't give core funding, despite years of pressure and lobbying. Second stage shelters offer safe housing for up to two years to women and children fleeing domestic violence. Saskatchewan has led the country in the rate of domestic violence for several years. In the past, the provincial government has only helped with capital funding. The Minister of Justice did not get into specifics about the amount or other details. She says that will come in two weeks. Second stage is generally in that 18 to 24 month period and, and there are a lot of um, important phases that that covers in terms of uh, making sure that, that people are safe, that their families are safe, um, and some in some cases that there are educational and other opportunities for children who are involved, job transitions for, for those fleeing violence. The opposition says the funding is long overdue and a positive step. It says it wants the funding to be adequate and sustainable year over year. It's very dangerous, yeah, because not only are you pushing your hours legally, you're also stressed and rushing. Coming up later in the show, an I-Team investigation. Several former employees of a Manitoba trucking company have filed a human rights complaint. They allege they drove in unsafe conditions and were discriminated against because they were foreign workers. Five long-haul truck drivers who were recruited from outside Canada share their stories with us. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. The Regina City Council has approved a plan to build a new aquatic centre, something many residents and groups say is long overdue. The proposed facility would serve as a replacement for the ageing Lawson Pool. It would feature more lanes, larger facilities and be heated by geothermal energy. The cost? $160 million. Today, Council voted unanimously to request most of the money from a federal infrastructure fund. If we can proceed with this, it positions us really well in terms of continuing to not just serve our community, a growing community, but um, to host events here as well for some of our competitive teams and to really expand uh, kids' opportunities to participate in competitive sports as well. A new aquatic centre was recommended by the Catalyst Committee and it's the first mega project on the list to officially be approved by Council. The council chambers at Saskatoon City Hall were packed today. Nearly two dozen people made presentations about the city's change room policy and how it applies to trans people. 
The majority of delegates were in favor of the current policy, which allows trans people to choose the change room that fits their gender identity. But some want the city to require trans people to use a separate room. This comes after protests outside the Shaw Aquatic Centre. A social media post complained that a trans woman used the women's change room. I hope that my words have proven that those in opposition of this policy are fear-mongering in a thinly veiled attempt to segregate and conceal transgender people from public life in Saskatoon. I urge this committee to uphold the constitutional rights of transgender people in our city and understand that the current policy is more than just a sign of support, but is on the whole beneficial and safer for all citizens of Saskatoon. Thank you. The city says its policy follows the Provincial Human Rights Code. The mayor says he has no intention of going backward. Saskatoon City Council's Finance Committee heard today from city staff about a plan to deal with an $11 million deficit. Inflationary pressure and major snow events both played a role in the deficit from 2022. Under provincial law, cities cannot run deficits. The city plans to use its reserves and a loan to pay it off. The Bank of Canada has left its trend-setting overnight interest rate unchanged at 4.5%. The pause comes after eight straight rate increases in the last year. In a statement, the bank said inflation is falling but remains too high. It stands at 5.9%. The Bank of Canada wants to bring inflation back to about 2%. This weather update is brought to you by It's March, It's Madness at Capital GMC Buick Cadillac. And weather specialist Ethan Williams joins me now. You promised a little bit of snow in Saskatchewan, and it really wasn't actually that much in the south. Yeah, we uh, really didn't end up getting a whole lot, and really many portions of Saskatchewan not getting that uh, either, Sam. And really Manitoba today not getting a whole lot of snow either, but it was northwestern Ontario where we actually saw a little bit of snow. We'll show you that on a satellite and radar in a second, but I, actually you can see where the snow fell on our current temperatures board because you can see this warm air surging up from Minnesota, and that's where that frontal boundary is, that warm front which is bringing temperatures close to the freezing mark. Warm spot in Manitoba today was Sprague, sitting at around the freezing mark, but a big temperature divide, minus 21 still up in Churchill. Uh, Saskatchewan temperatures mostly the same right now, kind of sitting in between the uh, minus 10 and minus 15 range. When you factor in the wind chill in uh, central portions of the province, getting close to minus 30, there's kind of a chilly stretch there. Tonight in uh, far northern Manitoba, I think you could get close to minus 40 with the wind chill, but again, still very warm in southeastern Manitoba and northwestern Ontario. Temperatures really not going to be changing all that much for any of us over these next few days. A couple reasons for that. First of all, the jet stream is uh, to the south at this point. That's still going to be bringing some of that cooler, unseasonable air to much of our provinces. And it's also zonal flow. This is when the uh, jet stream flows really straight from west to east. It's not uh, kinking or uh, ridging or troughing or anything like that. And it's going to be keeping us under fairly uh, stable conditions. But as you take a look at radar and satellite now, again, you can see Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, mostly clear to the north. Some uh, cloud cover building into southern Saskatchewan, and it's just hiding there. But you can see a little bit of snow in portions of northwestern Ontario. Expect another two centimeters in places like Dryden and Kenora down to the Lake of the Woods, Fort Francis. So that is a possibility tonight. And as we go through the uh, next 24 to 48 hours here, we'll see increasing cloudiness in southern Saskatchewan, some clearing in uh, the uh, Interlake and Parkland regions of Manitoba. And heading into tomorrow, though, I think a lot of south and central Manitoba and Saskatchewan going to be seeing cloud cover. Same for northwestern Ontario. Flurries still possible there. Clear to the north with high pressure. But then we start getting into Friday and Saturday and we have a system moving in from the states, which is going to be bringing significant snowfall to southern portions and central portions of Saskatchewan and uh, southern portions of Manitoba. Now, in terms of our wind gusts, we will see some breezy conditions in west central Saskatchewan tomorrow, getting close to 40 kilometers an hour. A bit breezy in Winnipeg and Brandon tomorrow afternoon. And then those winds really going to pick up as that system starts to move in close to 50, maybe 60 kilometers an hour in the southwest. It's a clipper system, so it's going to be bringing a, a little bit of uh, uh, wind gusts as we head through the day. Could be getting close to 60 in southeastern Saskatchewan as we head into Saturday morning. And then uh, gusty still through uh, southern and central Manitoba heading through the day Saturday and possibly into Sunday as well. Next seven days in Regina, looking cold to start things off, uh, about 10 degrees below average. And then again, that system bringing what could be close to 10 centimeters of so 
snow on Saturday before things warm up and we do finally see the sun once again heading into uh, next week. For Saskatoon, again, normal this time of year should be around minus one, but you'll be far from that mark for these next few days here. Again, looking at to some pretty breezy conditions Friday, five to 10 centimeters with that system before things uh, also start warming up and some sunshine makes an appearance. And for Winnipeg, we are uh, looking for at a mostly cloudy next few days here, but temperatures warmer than your counterparts in Saskatchewan. Uh, looking at uh, highs close to normal, sunshine also coming as well. I wish they would send some of that warmth our way, Sam. If you could have a chat with your weather gods and divert that clipper, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll head, uh, I'll head down there right now. Okay, thanks, Ethan. You bet. <laughs> Northern Ontario dominated Team Saskatchewan at the Tim Hortons Briar in London, Ontario today. Tanner Horgan's rank managed a 9-3 over Kelly Knapp's squad in the morning draw, dropping Saskatchewan down to sixth place in Pool A. Saskatchewan's back in action tomorrow morning against Nunavut. We'll be back after the break. They came to Canada for a better life. Five foreign workers hired by a Manitoba trucking company say they were taken advantage of and treated differently than Canadian employees. They filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission and just learned it's going to the next step. I-team reporter Caroline Bargou has the details. Matthew Barrett came to Manitoba in search of the Canadian dream. He found his own little piece of paradise in small-town Manitoba. Life is peaceful now. But he says it wasn't when he was working as a long-haul truck driver for Gladstone Transfer back in 2016. Barrett drove a semi in the UK, but never on a Canadian highway. He was told he would get training. He didn't. What's worse, Barrett says he was also given impossible deadlines. It's very dangerous, yeah. Because not only are you pushing your hours legally, you're also stressed and rushing. So you're taking more chances on the highway, like, to try and make yourself an extra 30 seconds here and there to try and make your time. It was really on a weekly basis. Mirzad Herzeglic is from Bosnia, hardened by war at home and abroad. He was a truck driver back home and then served as a bodyguard in Afghanistan during the war. But he says the job that offered him an in to the peace and quiet of Canada turned into a nightmare. Gladstone Transfer gave him a truck without air conditioning. He says he and other foreign workers were verbally abused and threatened with being sent back to their country of origin. Eventually, he left because he couldn't take it anymore. And I can tell you, I was I spent like 10 years working around in a dangerous, in a hostile environment. And I was like <clears throat> under the less stress in Afghanistan than in Canada. Mirsad is one of five former workers at Gladstone Transfer who filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission in 2020. They recently learned their case is moving to conciliation, the next step in the process. Manitoba Cabinet Minister and MLA for the area, Eileen Clark, says more than a dozen former employees of the company complained to her office about the working conditions. She referred the case to both levels of government. It eventually landed at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I felt the obligation to, to try and help these individuals. I, I don't feel like I have done enough, but I don't know where else to go either. You know, we are at the highest level. We're at Canadian Human Rights. And it's my understanding it's been, it's been there for quite a while, and there's no resolve. The owner of the company didn't want to be interviewed, but in an email denied all the allegations. He said a recent audit by the federal government found the company complied with its obligations for foreign workers. He says four of the five former employees who filed complaints were fired. His former operations manager says all workers were treated fairly. It, it really was a, a family environment. And that's not to say that families don't argue. That's not to say that there wasn't uh, employment issues, the same as there was with Canadian drivers. But in, in all cases, I implemented the progressive discipline policy fairly and consistently amongst all drivers. CBC News has seen a summary of the complaint that was filed. The report was created to help the commission decide on next steps and is not a final finding. As for the human rights complaint, a meeting is scheduled later this month to discuss a possible settlement between the company and the complainants. None of the allegations against Gladstone transfer have been proven. 
Caroline Bargut, CBC News, Gladstone, Manitoba. And Ethan's back with one last look at your weather. And a very chilly start to the morning in Regina and southern Saskatchewan. We'll be sitting around minus 20 with a mix of sun and cloud. With the wind chill, though, feeling closer to minus 30. And the sunshine not sticking around too long because we are going to get some increasing cloudiness. Winds staying fairly light, not uh, going to get much higher above minus 14, probably topping around, uh, out around minus 12 or so. Saskatoon, possibly some flurries tomorrow morning. Again, a very cold morning to start. A wind chill around minus 30 or so. Then getting to the afternoon. It looks like we're going to be seeing some cloudy conditions. You may get some breaks of sun as we head through the afternoon, though. But again, a topping out not much warmer than around minus 15, probably around minus 12. If you are in Winnipeg, though, a bit of a different story. We're looking for minus 8 tomorrow at 8 a.m. Cloud cover is a theme for all of us, though. You're going to be seeing cloudy skies. Wind's a little bit gusty from the northeast, around 30 kilometers an hour. And then as we head into the afternoon, cloud cover sticking around, going to be around minus 6. If you're in southeastern Manitoba, likely closer to the freezing mark. Same with north northwestern Ontario. Uh, You could be uh, seeing some uh, uh, cloudy skies with some light flurries as well. So warm for that area, Sam, but cold for just about everyone else. Lucky them. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And before we leave you tonight, we know across the prairies, so many parents spend hours building backyard rinks for their kids. A dad from Buffalo Pound Lake may deserve a trophy for the most elaborate design. But as Louise Big Eagle reports, it's about making space for simple pleasures. Ready, bro? Incoming! This is how Dakota Koontz takes practice shots on his son trip. They live at Buffalo Pound Lake, north of Moose Jaw, and built an outdoor rink in their front yard. And this is just one way Dakota gets down to it. My son absolutely loves hockey, and we just wanted to make it closer to home, so we decided to have a rink in the, on the lake because it's just so close. 11-year-old Trip is an avid goalie, and he likes to make his entrance this way. He spends hours on their homemade rink after school and on the weekend. Me and my dad decided to make a rink for, you know, so people can come out and have fun because uh, there's not a rink out here, and it's quite far from Tamusha, and there's lots of people that like hockey out here, and it's Saskatchewan and Canada, favorite sport. The father and son have built a rink every winter for several years and each time it gets more elaborate. They even made a small Zamboni from a rain barrel. Favorite part about this rink is the GT track that leads down to it, uh, the ice trail that leads down to it that has a fire pit for warming up. The mini stick rink is phenomenal. I'll be building that every year. It's so much fun. The ice shack to warm up in and to fish from is super fun. Trip loves when people fire pucks at him from up above. They bounce a lot, so They get pretty hyped if they score one, but they almost never do. Getting out on the ice is helping the family through a tough time. Dakota's mother recently passed away from a brain injury. I'm really going to push to build an outdoor rink for the community so it's up in the trees and sheltered from the the weather. And I want to name it after my mom that just passed away and also call it the Rink of Dreams because that is where dreams are made. Dreams and memories of ours together on the rink they built. Louise Big Eagle, CBC News, Buffalo Pound. How fun. That is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask or slash Manitoba or head over onto YouTube and check out the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube page. Dan and Ethan will be back with more local news at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much for watching and have a great night.